Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, dear friends. I am Dr. Jambukeshwaran, your prep ladder orthopedic faculty for you. Uh, today we are going to see 100 online session. Okay. Huh? Basically, okay, it will be very interesting. 100 points, that's all. 100 online. What are the most important things in orthopedics, that's all. Okay, 100 lines. We are, I have to cover. Uh, to me, actually, it's a Himalayan task because, you know, basically, uh, my way of teaching is very slow and steady and I used to explain a lot to my students in main recordings and all. We are done for more than 18 hours orthopedics, okay. But today, prep, prep ladder has asked me to do everything in one hour, okay, just 100 online. So, it's like uh, asking Rahul Dravid, Dravid to play a uh, match okay it's like that but sometimes no draw it also scores very good thing in 2020 so we'll see straight away one thing i promise dear friends be attentive take notes be attentive one thing i promise you all the points are important points definitely these are this has been asked in various our neat entrances initiate entrances all these points are very required points okay make a note right it will be very useful to you very interesting to you right the first question will straight away go first one liner most common cause of limp in a child if they ask a question usually you know the age is between 3 to 10 years this will be the most common cause of a limp in a child when you come across this right please read whether the limp they had mentioned just as a limp a painful limp or a painless limp something like that if the question if the, it is a painful limp the most common cause of a child the most common cause is always it is called transient synovitis hip that's the most common cause okay the limp in a child if it's a painful limp the most common cause in the whole world is transient synovitis hip okay what do you mean by transient synovitis hip transient synovitis hip some books are using the word this is otherwise called observation hip this is otherwise called observation hip okay observation hip see transient synovitis hip Actually, there, no book says clear cut this is the cause. But most of the book says that very commonly in our practice also, dear friends, this is very commonly associated with upper respiratory tract infection. A child usually will present like this. When you ask when the patient, the, the baby is brought to the OP with history of limp, a painful limp. When you ask history, they will say 10 days back, 2 weeks back, he had an URI. That's the only thing. The closest possible differential diagnosis for transient synovitis hip is septic arthritis. Septic arthritis. Okay, septic arthritis. This is the closest possible differential diagnosis for transient synovitis hip. In both the situation, both the things happens in child 3 to 10 years. Septic arthritis is a very serious condition. Transient synovitis hip is a harmless condition. How to differentiate this? In transient synovitis hip, they will present you with a low grade fever, otherwise most of the time no fever. Whereas if it is septic arthritis, they will present you with a high grade fever. Point number one. Point number two, C-reactive protein is very normal in transient synovitis hip. C-reactive protein is very much elevated in septic arthritis. Point number three. ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, normal in transient synovitis hip, it is elevated in septic arthritis. Okay, this is the closest possible differential diagnosis. What is the treatment of transient synovitis hip? Observation. Just you have to immobilize the child. You bed rest to the child for 14 days. Okay, antibiotics is not needed. Give a if at all needs a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, a brufen, that's all. This is the treatment protocol. Septic arthritis is totally a different condition. Since I told the most common cause of painful limp, you should know the most common cause of painless limp is DDH. Most common cause of painless limp is DDH. Okay. So, the first question, first one-liner is over. Right. See, one-liner means... I, I, I can't explain each and every point salient points I will tell I, I'll go like that okay kindly follow it will be very useful right it's a those who have finished orthopedics any set is fast approaching fifth is our exam so this is it's an excellent revision class for you okay triad of Klippelfield syndrome several times asked question dear friends Klippelfield syndrome 
it's a congenital condition everyone knows what is klippelfeld syndrome congenitally fused cervical vertebra what is klippelfeld syndrome congenitally fused cervical vertebra is klippelfeld syndrome what are the traits of klippelfeld syndrome number 1 short neck number 2 low hairline number 3 range of movement of neck is restricted range of movement is restricted neck movement restricted these are the triad a short neck a low hairline and restriction of neck movements klippel field syndrome you all know pretty well c1 is called atlas and c2 is called axis axis the very thing is when somebody calls you you will turn like this yes hello then you can turn this is called axial movement is by the c2 vertebra that's why it's called axis okay here what happens c1 c2 c3 everything is fused to form one vertebra that's called a block vertebra all the seven cervical vertebras fused to form one unit so it's called a block vertebra so the patient when you call him no he can't turn his neck he will turn the whole body he will respond like this this is how and whenever you read this klippel field syndrome whenever you read klippel field syndrome most common association of klippel field syndrome is with sprungal shoulder is with sprungal shoulder okay is with sprungal shoulder right so this is this is the triad of klippel field syndrome what is klippel field it is a congenitally fused cervical vertebra right good coming to the third one liner most common type of epiphyseal injury in a child epiphyseal injury we know that epiphyseal injuries we know that <coughs> there are the epiphyseal injury is classified by salter harris into five types rang came less uh, next then he added the sixth type so nowadays the epiphyseal injury is six types and it's called salter harris and rang classification salter harris and rang classification that's why so type 1 epiphyseal injury is complete separation of epiphysis from metaphysis without a fracture what is type 1 type 1 is complete separation of epiphysis from metaphysis without a fracture right so that is type 1 type 2 is complete separation of epiphysis from metaphysis epiphysis carries a small triangular bit of metaphysis along with it you see the picture this is the epiphysis this is the metaphysis when you see epiphysis has sheared totally it has came out of the metaphysis total separation of epiphysis from metaphysis and when you see this this epiphysis is carrying a small triangular bit of metaphysis along with it are able to see that you see <clears throat> see here it is carrying a small triangular bit of metaphysis and that is called thurston holland sign that's called thurston holland sign very important radiological sign and this is called type 2 this is called type 2 this is the most common type what is the most common type of epiphyseal injury type 2 is the most common type of epiphyseal injury how will you identify type 2 it will have positive thurston holland sign what is thurston holland sign epiphysis gets separated from metaphysis carrying a small triangular bit of metaphysis along with it okay so this is the most common type 99 percentage of epiphyseal injury the most common type it is type 2 type 2 okay good coming to the fourth one liner coming to the fourth one liner most common age of occurrence of SCFE stands for slipped capital femoral epiphysis. SCFE stands for slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Most common age of slipped capital femoral epiphysis is 14 to 16 years. Okay, it is 14 to 16 years. That is why this slipped capital femoral epiphysis is otherwise called adolescent coxa vera adolescent coxa vera okay 
I don't know what is very peculiar in this question. This in the topic slipped capital femoral epiphysis. This is the question that has been asked maximum number of times. Most common age of slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Some books uses the word slipped capital upper femoral epiphysis. So if this will become S C U F E. All are one and the same. Slipped capital upper femoral epiphysis. Most common it is 14 to 16, and it is otherwise called adolescent coxavara. Adolescent. Coxavara, right? You see, now I'll ask you a question, dear friends, right? So, see, uh, see, even though this is a live session, if I have my cell phone and go on seeing the chat box, the flow may be affected. So, I'm not doing that. And just, but it's my, uh, it is my duty to ask you questions, right? So that then only it will be interactive. So, this slipped capital femoral epiphysis, what is the classical X ray sign? What is a classical radiological sign? If you take an AP view, it will show you a sign called Tratho 1. Okay, this is called Tratho 1. This is called a Tratho 1 sign, a radiological sign, Tratho 1 sign. What is that? You take an AP pelvis with both hips AP view. You draw a line along the superior margin of the neck. You draw a line along the superior margin of the neck. Right, in superior margin of the neck, this should go and cut a part of the head. It should go and cut a part of the head. If it is not cutting, that's called a positive Tratovan sign. That's called a positive Tratovan sign. Is it going on? Uh -huh. Right, so it is called a positive Tratovan sign. Right. Now we'll move on to the fifth. Investigation of choice, investigation of choice in case of developmental dysplasia hip. This is very simple, straightforward answer. Investigation of choice for development dysplasia. Developmental dysplasia hip was previously called congenital dislocation hip. The investigation of choice is not X-ray. Investigation of choice is always ultrasound. Ultrasound is the investigation of choice for development and dysplasia hip okay so ultrasound real time ultrasound and again it's my duty all right right so my test match uh, this the, the trait is uh, coming i want to tell as many points as possible developmental dysplasia hip you should not forget the two classical clinical sign not actually two it is three important clinical sign number one ortholonis test number two barlow's test number three galeasi sign galeasi sign is otherwise called alice test what is Barlow's test or uh, what is Ortholonis test? Ortholonis test is called test of entry. Ortholonis test is called test of entry. Right. What is that? A dislocated hip is coming to you. You are trying to abduct and internally rotate. You are trying to abduct and internally rotate. What happens? This dislocated hip will go and get relocated with a click sound. That is called Ortholonis test. Barlow's test is the baby at present is not having a dislocated hip but you are suspecting that's a case of developmental dysplasia so you are trying to dislocate a dislocatable hip so that is barlow's test that is that is a provocative test so mostly they will advise you not to do it ortholony is a good thing what is the third thing galeasi test other galeasi sign otherwise called alice test make the baby lie down in a supine position flex both the hip joint to 90 degree flex both the knee joint to 90 degree see the level of the knee joints normally both the knee joints should be at the same level if it is a case of developmental dysplasia hip on the affected side the knee will be at lower level then it is called alice test other is called galeasi sign okay so ddh these are important points that can be asked okay so the baby what are the limitations of movement abduction external rotation will be limited abduction external rotation will be limited if it's a case of sufi that is slipped capital femoral epiphysis abduction internal rotation will be restricted so they are asking a lot of uh, what was that clinically framed questions no if they ask a question uh, an adolescent boy having a um, limp painful limp on examination, abduction internal rotation restricted, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. A small baby, abduction external rotation is limited, CDH or DDH. Okay, very simple. Most common, the coming to the next one liner, most common association with CTEV, congenital talipus equinovirus, most common association with CTEV. Okay, 
This is a sure question. Most common association of CTEV is, by this time you would have guessed, you know the answer. It is neural tube defect. Neural tube defects. Neural tube defects. Neural tube defects is otherwise called, you can, in a simple term, this is called spina bifida. Spina bifida. Spina bifida, again, usually, you know, this is an additional point, not related with the CTV. So, it's an additional point. Spina bifida is usually, is of two types. Spina bifida occulta, spina bifida aperta. Two types are there. Spina bifida, you know, it is an open neural tube defect. Right? Open neural tube defect can be occulta. Occulta means, you can't see just to over the skin, the skin everything is intact, you can't see it directly, it's a closed type, that is called occulta. It may show you some neurocutaneous markers like tuft of hair, a dimple over it, so only that much will be there in the skin, that's called occulta. And open, you just you can see an open, it is in, it's an open type that's called aperta, that's called aperta. The most common type is always occulta. Most common type of spina bifida is occulta and that is the most common association with CTEV. CTEV is commonly associated with spina bifida, occulta to be more precise. Other associations you all know but it's my duty. If you want, yes, I will tell you. Most common association I have told you. Other associations, arthrogryposis, arthrogryposis congenita is an association. It can be associated with the tibial hemimalia. Ask the question. Tibial hemimalia. Hemimalia means absent. Tibia is absent on one side. But the baby, when you bring the baby, you know, in a case of CTV baby, with the tibial hemimalia, one side tibia, fibula will be normal. On, on another side, only fibula is there, no tibia. Then it's called tibial hemimalia. It's called tibial hemimalia. That's an association. And aptly uses a word lateral popliteal nerve palsy it is a lateral popliteal nerve lateral popliteal nerve palsy nerve palsy okay nerve palsy this is an association right and last but not the least even though this is an outdated condition poliomyelitis poliomyelitis okay polio Right? Even though it's an outdated condition, you should know. See, these are the common, also not common, most common is neural tube defect. Other common things, other things you should know is arthrogryposis multiplex congenita, tibial hemimalia, lateral popliteal nerve palsy, poliomyelitis, and aptly adds one more thing also cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy. When you read, it will be in the same order in aptly. Cerebral palsy. Okay. These are the associations. Yes. We will move on to the next one liner. Most common bone involved in congenital pseudoarthrosis is okay. Pseudoarthrosis means it's a type of non-union. When something happens because secondary to a fracture, when something happens, see, dear friends, please concentrate. Look at me. You just focus your attention on me. These are rare topics, but very important topics for any set. Okay, you just concentrate on me. See, whenever a fracture has happened. When the bone has not united, you are using the word non-union, non-union. So, the, a definitive cause is there, a definitive cause is there, fracture is the cause. Because second, after fracture means something has happened, loss of blood supply would have happened, ischemia, infection would have happened. It has not been reduced properly, it has not been immobilized properly due to several causes that bone has not united, you are using the term non-union. You are using the term non-union. If the same thing happens congenitally because of a birth defect, that is called pseudoarthrosis. That is called pseudoarthrosis. So, the most common cause of pseudoarthrosis is idiopathic actually. Most common cause of pseudoarthrosis. That is not the question. My question is most common bone involved. I am telling the most common cause of most common cause of pseudoarthrosis is idiopathic. When you rule out idiopathic, the second common cause all the book says is neurofibroma. Neurofibroma. Okay. Book says especially type 1. Type 1 neurofibroma. So, for congenital pseudoarthrosis, the question you can expect, it can be idiopathic or it is most commonly it's associated with type 1 neurofibroma. 
what is the problem <coughs> what is the basic defect it is causing some sort of bone dysplasia either idiopathically or this type of neurofibroma is causing a sort of bone dysplasia so that bone dysplasia is not allowing the bone to unite at all so congenitally the baby is born born it is born with a non-union that is called pseudoarthrosis. Now coming to my question, most common bone involved in congenital pseudoarthrosis is tibia. It is tibia. Very, very, very important question. Most common bone that is involved, most common bone that is affected by congenital pseudoarthrosis is tibia. Okay. Why it is called pseudoarthrosis? Arthro means joint. Arthro means joint. The very function of joint is mobility. Mobility is joint. Okay. Right. Pseudoarthrosis means since the upper part of tibia is not united, since it is totally into fragment and it's painless also. Okay. It is not causing pain. It will function like another joint, not a real joint. So a pseudo joint. So the word pseudoarthrosis. Okay. Right. Now, yeah, friends, coming to the next thing, blount disease okay what is blount disease what is blount disease blount disease is what is that yes blount disease is <coughs> this is infantile blount disease is infantile tibia varum what is blount disease blount disease is infantile tibia varum okay when a baby is born, a newborn, you can't appreciate this, you know, varum, bow leg is called varum, knock knee is called valgum, genu varum, genu valgum. So, this is upper part of tibia, it will go for varus deformity, an angular deformity, bow leg deformity, bow leg leg deformity, upper end of the tibia, not the knee joint, upper end of the tibia. So, it is called infantile tibia varum. Infantile tibia varum is due to compression and damage to the medial articular surface, medial growth area of the tibia, upper tibia. Okay. So, infantile tibia varum, when a baby is born, you can't appreciate it. Then when will you appreciate? You will appreciate only when the baby starts this, this blown disease manifests or tibia varum occurs. Tibia varum occurs during the walking stage, during the walking stage. If a baby is one year, if the baby is not walking, you can't appreciate and it won't develop also. It has the tendency to develop, but it won't develop when there is no weight bearing. So what is the cause? Weight bearing is the cause. Weight bearing is the cause. So this they had found out, blown disease is more common in early walkers. Early walkers. So early walking is also not good for a baby. Okay, so blown disease is infantile tibia varum okay yes coming to the next one liner kefis disease is kefis disease is what is kefis disease kefis disease is what is kefis disease it is infantile hyperostosis Infantile hyperostosis. Kefis disease is infantile hyperostosis. Kefis disease is infantile hyperostosis. And Kefis disease mimics a closest possible thing you can say it may mimic like an osteomyelitis. Kefis disease, infantile hyperostosis. It may mimic like an osteomyelitis. And the most common bone that is involved is jawbone infantile it is jawbone okay right and so hallmark now coming to the next one liner hallmark radiological sign of osteomalacia hallmark radiological sign of osteomalacia the osteomalacia and rickets are one and the same we all know they are it is due to vitamin d deficiency when vitamin d deficiency happens before epiphyseal closure that is called a rickets when vitamin D deficiency happens after epiphyseal closure, that is called osteomalacia. That's called osteomalacia. Okay. So, what happens? You no, know, osteomalacia, humpty number of super, super radiological signs are there. Okay. Like a biconcave vertebra. 
trifoil pelvis other is called triradiate pelvis so many signs are there spontaneous fracture of ribs all these are given in aptly radiological signs of osteomalacia but one sign aptly uses a word stamp of osteomalacia when this sign comes there is no second differential diagnosis because biconcave vertebra i am telling this in osteomalacia when you read in bone tumor topic the same biconcave vertebra other is called codfish vertebra happens in multiple myeloma also so some differential diagnosis are there so that means it is not the surest radiological sign so the pathognomonic radiological sign otherwise the stamp of osteomalacia is looser zone is this looser zone is the stamp or the classical radiological hallmark radiological sign of osteomalacia looser zone looser zone some books uses the word pseudo fracture they are called pseudo fracture milkmaid's fracture milkman's fracture okay so this is the this happens in epiphyseo metaphyseal junction it happens in epiphyseo metaphyseal junction so hallmark radiological sign of osteomalacia is looser zone <clears throat> so coming to this rickets most common cause of rickets worldwide is renal rickets it's my duty to say most because i have to finish as many most common treatment of choice investigations as possible okay in this given session most common cause of rickets throughout the world is renal this renal rickets is otherwise called hypophosphatemic rickets otherwise called resistant rickets so these are the synonyms throughout when you take harrison he gives very clearly most common cause of rickets in the world now it is renal but in our country most common cause of rickets even today even in 2023 it is nutritional rickets you should not forget this point okay yes now the next question pelkan spur is a feature of pelkan spur is a feature of okay pelkan spur where it happens looser zone means diagnosis rickets osteomalacia diagnosis is osteomalacia looser zone pelkan spur means the diagnosis is scurvy pelkan spur means diagnosis is scurvy so in scurvy you should know <coughs> three terminologies one is called tremor feel zone okay tremor feel zone another a pelkan spur the third thing is white line of wrinkle white line of wrinkle at least these three things you should know okay tremor feel zone okay tremor feel zone tremor feel zone pelkan spur white line of wrinkle whenever you see in the radiology translucency in the metaphysis a translucency in the metaphysis that is called a tremor field zone that is called tremor field zone okay a tremor field zone when the edges of the metaphysis the edges of the tremor field zone metaphysis when they undergo a fracture in corner of the metaphysis okay a corner fracture corner fracture of the metaphysis okay that is called pelkan pelkan spur that's called a pelkan spur what happens though that corner fracture this again will get calcified look like an osteophyte a hook like thing that's called a spur like thing so it's called a pelkan spur okay that is the explanation right white line of frankel is calcification happening in the epiphysis calcification happening in the epiphysis the growth plate calcification happening in the growth plate is called white line of frankel you see here see if i draw with this pen you can't appreciate just look at this diagram you are seeing a translucency in the metaphysis 
this is epiphysis that is metaphysis a translucency in the metaphysis and that is called trummerfeld zone the corner of that metaphysis you are seeing a hook like thing okay you are able to see a hook like thing like this okay that is called the pelican spur that is called pelican spur the whole white thing this calcification no this calcification is called white line of frankel this provisional calcification the whole this thing this white calcification it is called white line of frankel so radiologically scurvy you can expect what pelican spur you can expect tremor fill zone you can expect white line of frankel at least these three things right coming to the next mcq okay most common bone involved in brown tumor what is brown tumor primary hyperparathyroidism primary hyperparathyroidism this is otherwise called osteitis cystica osteitis fibros osteitis fibrosa cystica okay this is otherwise called osteitis fibrosa cystica brown tumor okay brown tumor actually when you see microscopically pathology histopathologically what you will see it's an expansile lesion it's an expansile lesion which contains osteoclast which contains osteoclast okay because it is hyperparathyroidism primary hyperparathyroidism brown tumor okay osteo uh, full of osteoclast what are the common bones that are involved in brown tumor what are the common most common bone involved in brown tumor should be very careful maxilla is the most common bone maxilla is the most common bone equally common bone is mandible equally common bone is mandible okay so most common bone involved in brown tumor other is called uh, osteitis fibrosa cystica brown tumor is other is called osteitis fibrosa cystica what is the cause primary hyperparathyroidism what is that it's an expansile lytic bone lesion which consists of lot of osteoclast osteoclast okay osteoclast that is called brown tumor most common bone involved is maxilla equally common bone involved is mandible okay yes several times asked the question most common bone involved in paget's disease most common bone involved in paget's disease paget's disease is otherwise called osteitis deformans most common bone involved osteate paget's disease is otherwise called osteitis deformans paget's disease see hyperparathyroidism osteoclastic activity brown tumor what is the problem in paget's disease paget's disease there is increased osteoblastic activity as well as osteoclastic activity paget's disease there is increased osteoblastic activity and there is increased osteoclastic activity okay so but one question they are asked this question several times in iniset that is old aims question bank and all primarily paget's disease is a problem where is the pathology what is the problem primarily paget's disease problem is in the osteoclast please register in your mind pages disease there is increased osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity there is no doubt primarily what is the problem defective osteoclast so excessive osteoclastic activity unwanted osteoclastic activity starts first to compensate that osteoblastic activity comes second so bone is formed but it's not a healthy bone so it is easily broken brittle bone so go on from lot of pathological fracture happens pathological fracture happens so it is called osteitis deformans osteitis deformans how can you prove that this guy is having pages guy is having increased osteoblastic as well as osteoclastic activity the investigation says alkaline phosphatase osteoblastic thing activity a, a chemical marker for osteoclastic alkaline serum alkaline phosphatase elevated increased the elevation of the hydroxyproline in urine which is a marker for osteoclastic activity so pages is proved pages if i talk talk about pages it will take half an hour how many radiological signs we had seen in pages okay if you want to refer that just see my main videos 
How many radiological signs? Many read blade of grass appearance, cartel in appearance of the skull, picture window frame appearance of the vertebra. Okay, right. Lot of uh, questions are there in Pages disease, right? Blade of grass, cartel spot, picture window frame vertebra. So many things are the Pages. Pages is one thing which causes uh, what I can say. It it causes uh, a narrowing of all the cranial nerve cavities in the cranial of the base of the skull. So it can cause craniopathies and Pages disease. What is the basic pathology when you take the bone, when you see that, when you just look at that on the microscope and when you see, you know, it will give a mosaic pattern because there is micro arteriovenous fistulae that is happening in Pages. So there will be hyperdynamic circulation and death in Pages disease because of cardiac failure. And Pages disease is a precancerous condition more prone to cause osteogenic sarcoma. Many, many points are there. Pages disease. Okay. Pain in Pages is specifically controlled by calcitonin. Drug of choice for Pages disease is bisphosphonates. Okay. Alandronate, pamidronate. Now it's zolindronic acid. Drug of choice. Okay. Now the question asked here is most common bone that is involved in Pages disease. The answer is pelvis. This is the most common should refer the higher books. Some MCQ books are given a wrong answer. I am not going to tell you the wrong answer because that will get embedded in your mind. Please, dear friends, trust me. The most common bone that's involved in Pages disease is pelvis. Next to pelvis, the second common bone that is involved is tibia. Third common bone involved is vertebra. Okay. Pelvis, tibia, vertebra. Just if you remember pelvis, tibia, vertebra, it's more than enough. Most common bone, second common bone, third common bone in Pages disease. Other is called osteitis deformance. Okay, right. Now, now coming to certain important tumor questions. Here you should be very, very alert, dear friends. Most commons and tumors, no, often misleading. Unless others don't have the concept, very strict concept in your mind, no. On the exam table, we tend to make mistake and I don't want my guys to make any mistakes in the exam. Please listen. See, most common, read the question carefully. Most common primary benign bone tumor. Most common primary benign bone tumor. Without controversy, because some books are giving a different answer. I am not going to tell the wrong answer. You follow. Okay, there is no time for us. You trust me. That is that is our duty to tell the correct thing. You trust me. You just follow most common primary benign bone tumor without doubt osteochondroma. Osteochondroma. This is otherwise called exostosis. Exostosis. Okay. Most common primary malignant bone tumor. Most common primary malignant bone tumor when they ask a question like this you carefully search whether they had given any age group any age group suppose if the question is elderly suppose the question is elderly they use the word elderly most common primary malignant bone tumors in elderly without doubt the answer is multiple myeloma Multiple myeloma. The same question, young individuals, especially they are given age group like 20 years, second decade, something like that. Then they are not asking for multiple myeloma, dear friends. The answer is osteogenic sarcoma. Osteogenic sarcoma. Please. Please be very vigilant. Be very careful. Okay. Nowadays, tough competition, dear friends. One question matters. I am telling you. A question matters. Right. So, if it is most common primary, the word primary is very important. Most common primary malignant bone tumor. If they are not given any age group, you just take multiple myeloma. Elderly, multiple myeloma. Young individuals. 20 years, 30 years, something like that. Answer is osteogenic sarcoma. Third, very clear the answer is most common primary solid malignant bone tumor. If they use the word solid in between, there is no doubt 
the answer is osteogenic sarcoma answer is osteogenic sarcoma look at the last point most common bone tumors if they ask generally a question like this most common bone tumors it is answer is secondaries secondaries okay i repeat once again dear friends always at any given time most common bone tumors are secondaries primaries are rare secondaries mostly they they are they occur from breast in the case of female prostate and lung in case of male primary will be either prostate or breast secondary happens in the bone osteoblastic secondaries okay most common bone tumor is always secondaries if they want to ask primary they should use the word primary most common primary benign bone tumor osteochondroma most common primary malignant bone tumor young age osteogenic sarcoma most common primary malignant bone tumor elderly it is multiple myeloma most common primary solid malignant bone tumor osteogenic sarcoma okay should never get confused dear friends this is very important area this will appear very simple but slippery area we are not going to slip okay yes now time honored mcqs time honored mcqs match the following radiological appearances match the following radiological cauliflower like appearance the x ray a cauliflower like appearance the only diagnosis it comes as osteochondroma cauliflower like appearance osteochondroma that is called exostosis that is called exostosis now right. they use the word no this is this is there in apply but so far unasked dear friends that's why i'm underlying this i'm putting a box this is not asked in any of the indian entrants i am expecting this question very soon carrot shaped alna carrot shaped alna very peculiar you know the shape of a carrot tapering the base is broad as it goes towards the tip it is tapering so a yeah, carrot shaped alna the diagnosis is hereditary multiple exostosis hereditary multiple exostosis okay this is an expected question please note this point pluck or wisp like classic calcification a fluck or wisp wisp like a wisp okay fluck or a wisp like calcification the diagnosis is enchondroma diagnosis is enchondroma you know pretty well enchondroma is a benign bone tumor which affects the cancellous bone and the most common site is phalanges little finger and ring finger these are the most phalanges fingers the most common site enchondroma it is it causes destruction of the cancellous bone it is inside the bone it is not seen outside that's why the word en en means inside exo means outside exostosis protruding out so it's called exostosis this is enchondroma okay inside the bone okay the appearance is it is called the, the it will give a fleck or wisp of calcification right since it is causing a calcification an osteolytic lesion exactly like an o this has one more name in our old robins old robins time honored robins this is called o ring sign this is called an o ring sign so whenever they ask a question o ring sign wisp of calcification fleck of calcification the answer is enchondroma answer is enchondroma stippled calcification please read this stippled calcification i think visible slip stippled calcification otherwise mottled calcification when they use a word stippled calcification or mottled calcification the answer is chondroblastoma the answer is chondroblastoma chondroblastoma is a benign bone tumor which affects a child usually age 10 years child where it affects epiphysis so epiphyseal osteolytic lesion in a child chondroblastoma epiphyseal osteolytic lesion in an 35 or 40 year old man giant cell tumor okay so giant cell tumor is called osteoclastoma osteoclastoma age group is different site is the same radiological appearance 
almost appears the same. It's like an osteolytic lesion. Osteolytic lesion, see, I will, again, I will consult it. Dear friends, please concentrate. Osteolytic lesion of the epiphysis. You ask the question paper setter, what is the age, man? 10 years, chondroblastoma. 35 years, chain cell tumor, otherwise osteoplastoma. Very simple. Okay, if it is chondroblastoma, it gives a stippled or a mottled calcification. Last but not the least, you are seeing ground glass appearance in the x-ray. You are seeing a ground glass appearance in the x-ray. The only diagnosis it is fibrous dysplasia. It is fibrous dysplasia. So, all are time honored standard MCQ dear friends. Okay. So, ground glass appearance fibrous dysplasia. Right. Good. We will move on to the next uh, one liner, 16th one liner. Two causes for soap bubble appearance. Two causes for soap bubble appearance. First cause, even LKG baby will answer the first cause. Okay. There is no doubt. Okay. LKG babies, our guys know. Hey, they will trash. Hey, inna, sir. What is this, sir? What is this, sir? So, two causes of soap bubble appearance. First cause, everyone knows. GCT. There is no doubt. Jane cell tumor. Second cause for soap bubble appearance is adamantinoma. Adamantinoma. Okay. Adamantinoma. Please don't confuse amyloblastoma with adamantinoma. Okay. Amyloblastoma is different. Adamantinoma is different. Because many books wrongly confuses this with amyloblastoma. And they are giving, even though it's a wrong answer, it's my duty to tell you, dear friends, please concentrate. Please concentrate. We guys are not going to make mistakes in the exam. Okay. Right. Amyloblastoma, the most common site is jawbone. Adamantinoma, the most common site is tibia, upper tibia. Adamantinoma, the most common site is upper tibia. Right. So, soap bubble appearance in orthopedics. Only two differential diagnoses, dear friends. Everyone knows giant cell tumor, osteoclastoma, one. Second, you should not forget. Okay. Pra bladder, you should not forget. Second, adamantinoma. Right. Coming to the 17th one-liner. Popcorn calcification. Look at the superb x-ray. See, excellent x-ray. You just, after the class is over, just again, you just, you just, you just uh, zoom it and see. Excellent x-ray. Popcorn calcification. This is called popcorn calcification. Popcorn calcification, otherwise punctate comma shaped calcification. Popcorn calcification, otherwise called a punctate comma like this Pun punctate comma like calcification this is one thing popcorn calcification other is called punctate comma calcification number two endosteal endosteal mean inside the bone endosteal scalloping what is the meaning you look at this diagram endosteal see this is the cortex this is the medulla inside the cortex many bones are what is the meaning of scalloping scalloping is nothing but resorption of bone Scalloping is nothing but resorption of bone. So, endosteal resorption, endosteal scalloping, you are getting a popcorn calcification. What could be the tumor? Popcorn calcification or punctate shape, comma shaped calcification, endosteal scalloping is a feature of what tumor? Shall I write the answer? Chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma. Okay, so far what we have seen is chondroblastoma, that is different chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the cartilage. You all know osteochondroma can get transformed into chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma. So, in chondrosarcoma, the X-ray appearance is called popcorn calcification or punctate shape comma calcification. Otherwise, it has one more feature called endosteal resorption, endosteal absorption of bones. The technical term is endosteal scalloping. Please, please note these two things. Not often asked MCQ, I am expecting this time. How many times they will ask you soap bubble? How many times they will ask you onion peel? The rotten MCQs. This is waiting for us. So popcorn like calcification. 
popcorn calcification of the lungs in general medicine they would have taught you hamartoma popcorn calcification of the lung hamartoma popcorn calcification of the bone chondrosarcoma okay right look at the 18th one liner all are essential point see dear friends i can't explain these are essence no these are essence but definitely it will be useful definitely it will be useful especially those who are revising no one hour this is really useful you see chicken wire calcification is seen in first of all you should know so far what we are seeing radiological 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 you should think this is not a radiological finding chicken wire calcification is a histopathological finding it is a histopathological hp finding histopathological finding chicken wire calcification is seen in which tumor which seen in which tumor you know you know the answer you know it is once again your chondroblastoma 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 okay chondroblastoma what we had seen was a radiological feature radiological feature of chondroblastoma what we had seen stippled calcification mottled calcification okay lytic lesion in the epiphysis in a child 10 years that is radiological histopathologically chondroblastoma will show you a classical chicken wire calcification okay so this in between the matrix or fibrous matrix and you are seeing the cells with fibrous matrix in between which gives exactly like a chicken wire this has one more chicken wire calcification this is given in robins one more synonym is also there this is called cobblestone appearance cobblestone appearance cobblestone appearance right chicken wire calcification other is called cobblestone appearance histopathological thing of chondroblastoma my final thing do you know the other name for chondroblastoma suddenly some okay some sadistic examiner who is setting a paper no directly he may may not ask you chondroblastoma control our our guys will answer no some sadists are sitting they are taking questions okay to your sadist no you should be another sadist yeah give me man i will answer the other name for chondroblastoma is the other name for chondroblastoma is very simple cordman's tumor cordman's tumor okay cordman's cordman's triangle is different cordman's triangle is a radiological feature comes in osteogenic sarcoma chondroblastoma is otherwise called cordman's tumor okay right coming to the next one liner okay coming to the next one liner shepherd crook deformity is seen in shepherd crook deformity is seen in first of all you should know what is a shepherd crook look at the diagram beautifully it is given shepherds will be having a hook like stick that's called a shepherd crook so that they can herd the sheep okay so shepherd crook exactly you see you compare first you see you just approach see hi hi i know man our field is science i know okay practice this science like an art so that till the end we will be happy this is what always i used to tell my students no don't feel the burden don't think that you are reading something for mark and all you enjoy it like an art like an you have you seen artist have you ever got tired a singer or a dancer or a painter no they go on enjoying their work our field gives immense thing our field is a science field practice the science like an art you just see this you see this shepherd what a beautiful real shepherd crook you see here the femur exactly curved like a shepherd crook yes or no that's why you see that yes or no you are able to see very clearly now so that's why this is called a shepherd crook deformity this is called a shepherd crook deformity obviously you know the answer shepherd crook deformity happens in fibrous dysplasia happens in fibrous dysplasia fibrous dysplasia many types are there two types are there okay three types are there monoostatic polyostatic um, facial three types are there monoostatic common bone clavicle polyostatic involves many bones especially your pelvis and skull so many things are there pelvis mean pelvis hip and uh, um, other bones 
so polyostatic and you know pretty well fibrous dysplasia can be associated with hormonal imbalance they can present to you with the kefalia spots precocious puberty and that's called mccune albright syndrome okay we how many times we had read so what is the problem of this shepherd what is the thing fibrous dysplasia the bone is a faulty bone fibrous dysplasia it is a dysplastic bone very frequently it will go for fractures when fracture happens in the upper part of the femur when fracture happens in the upper part of the femur usually it will unite but unite in a crooked fashion like a shepherd crook usually end result will be like this so this is called a shepherd crook deformity a pathological fracture uniting in a wrong fashion like a shepherd crook so it's called a shepherd crook deformity okay polyostatic mostly shepherd crook deformity happens in polyostatic fibrous dysplasia okay mccune albright syndrome so very important shepherd crook deformity fibrous dysplasia another radiological appearance already we had discussed it will give a ground glass appearance x-ray bone appears like a ground glass ground glass appearance of the bone fibrous dysplasia shepherd crook deformity fibrous dysplasia yes skip lesion in bone is a feature of first of all dear friends i want to tell you skip lesion means one area tumor will be there in the same bone rest of the bone will be normal another area another area it will show you a tumor tumor cells this is called skip lesion this is called a skip lesion not continuous skipped skip lesion first of all dear friends i want to tell you by which investigation you will see a skip lesion that many many we may think in a wrong fashion x-ray something no no skip lesion is seen only in bone scan okay it's seen in bone scan not in x-ray bone scan whenever a question skip lesion in bone scan a question comes like the diagnosis the answer is osteogenic sarcoma osteogenic sarcoma osteogenic sarcoma okay good what are the coming to the next one liner what are the tumors associated with true rosette we have read this true rosette in three subjects in our medical fraternity dear friends one first time i read this in pathology robins okay number two i read this in ophthalmology textbook Number three, I read this in orthopedic textbook. Okay, pathology, ophthalmology, orthopedics. True rosette, you are Robbins. <clears throat> True rosette, you are Robbins uses the word flexner wintersteiner rosette. This is the name of true rosette. It's called flexner wintersteiner rosette. What are the tumors that causes that <coughs> gives? True rosette or flexner wintersteiner rosette. Number one, retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma. Number two, osteogenic sarcoma. Osteogenic sarcoma. Okay. Retinoblastoma. Osteogenic sarcoma, true rosette, other is called flexner wintersteiner rosette. Now I will tell my pathology correlation. You take your pathology today, tonight you are going to take your pathology textbook and you are going to refer. The chromosomal aberration or anomaly that is seen in retinoblastoma is 13Q14. I don't think you will say no, because this is a very famous question in pathology. Okay. The chromosomal anomaly or aberration, chromosomal uh, aberration that is happening in retinoblastoma is called 13Q14. That is why 13Q14 is called RB gene. RB gene. Q is long arm. 13 long arm 14. 13Q14. This is called RB gene. So, it is called RB stands for retinoblastoma gene. Same mutation that is aberration that is happening in osteogenesis imperfecta also 13q14. That is why Robbins very clearly says that those who have developed retinoblastoma, high chance of developing osteogenic sarcoma. Those who have developed osteogenic sarcoma, high chance of developing retinoblastoma. 
13 q 14 so both shows a true rosette flexner wintestina rosette this itself can be a pathology question for you a 27 year old guy developed osteogenic sarcoma there is a high chance that he will develop one of the following tumor in the choice retinoblastoma is there that is the answer other way around retinoblastoma it is osteogenic sarcoma got it yes you see once you are finished true rosette you should know about pseudo rosette also what are the two tumors associated with pseudo rosette pseudo rosette is called your robins is using the homer right true rosette is flexner intestinal rosette pseudo rosette is homer right rosette two tumors number one neuroblastoma Number two, Ewing's sarcoma. Okay. So, true rosette, it is osteogenic sarcoma. Pseudo rosette, it is Ewing's sarcoma. Right. Coming to the 23rd one liner, night cries is a classical feature of which bone tumor? Night cries is a classical feature of which bone tumor? Very simple. Okay. Whenever you come across a word night cries in, in tumor chapter, the answer is osteoid osteoma. Osteoid osteoma. You know pretty well the hallmark of osteoid osteoma. There is a word you would have read nidus. The hallmark of osteoid osteoma is nidus. Okay. What is nidus? A seed like thing, if you take osteoid osteoma, happens in the diaphysis, shaft of the long bone diaphysis, very commonly tibia, the most common site is tibia, shaft of tibia, diaphysis of the tibia. When you take an x-ray, it will show you a radiolucent area surrounded by an <coughs> sclerotic ring. Inside that radiolucent area, a seed like thing will be there and that is called the nidus. Nidus used to Nidus used to release prostaglandins. Nidus used to release prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, pain substance, you know. Nidus, and especially during early morning hours, midnight, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Okay, it used to release a lot of prostaglandins. Nidus used to release prostaglandins, cause a severe pain which will disturb uh, the patient. He will get up from the bed and he will start wincing of pain. That's called the night cries. That is called night cries. This is the mechanism of night cry in osteoid osteoma whenever you come across night cry in orthopedics two things should cross your mind dear friends number one tumor cause osteoid osteoma number two infective cause skeletal tuberculosis two causes for night cries okay answer for this is over i am telling you an extra point two causes for night cries one cause is osteoid osteoma another cause is skeletal tb Here the mechanism of night cries is different, dear friends. I will explain. I will go to the next one liner. See, the primary focus of um, the primary focus of uh, your, uh, your tuberculosis is synovium. Primary focus of tuberculosis is sin one one second. Primary focus of tuberculosis is synovium. What happens? No, there is synovitis. There is synovitis. You know pretty well synovium is rich in nerve supply. Rich in nerve supply. Very sensitive area. Periosteum rich in nerve supply. Synovium rich in nerve supply. Bone, there is nothing. Bone is insensitive. Periosteum is very sensitive. Synovium is very sensitive. Okay. What happens during daytime? We continuously walk. Synovitis is there. But we walk, skeletal muscles are contracted. So from outside, skeletal muscles are acting like a splint. It is compressing the synovium. It's like a splint, it's acting. Okay. Once you go to sleep and you are in deep sleep, especially REM phase, rapid eye movement, all the muscles get flabby. They are relaxed, no? So skeletal muscles are relaxed. So what happens? Suddenly, synovium starts stretching. The stretch pain is the cause for night cries in skeletal TB. Nidus is caused for night pain in osteoastioma. Okay, yes. Again, time honored. LKG, UKG questions match the following radiological appearances. Okay, yes. Soap bubble appearance, 
osteoclastoma okay osteoclastoma with that you should add adamantinoma also adamantinoma also okay adamantinoma also onion peel appearance evening sarcoma onion peel appearance evening sarcoma okay moth eaten appearance of the bone please okay please Onion peel one lakh time repeated question man it's a rotten MCQ okay guys of our caliber no even if it appears in the entrance you should not attempt a hey, go go it's a such a stupid simple question I don't want to get a PG seat with such a simple question should skip okay that common onion peel everyone knows but another two appearances are there in the textbook and for some other reason they are not asking so far so something tells my mind this year you can expect two new questions from heaving sarcoma called moth eaten appearance heaving sarcoma moth eaten appearance of the bone moth eaten appearance many places in pathology it will come moth eaten appearance of the kidney membranous glomerulonephritis moth eaten appearance of the bone two causes are there dear friends one is heaving sarcoma another one cause is there that is an outdated condition okay i think you remember that word yas non venereal syphilis yas pinta bejal all those non venereal syphilis in yas moth eaten appearance of bone can happen so whenever a moth eaten appearance of bone comes two things should strike your mind leaving sarcoma yas then you look like that cracked eyes appearance leaving sarcoma so these two things they have not asked so far so be very careful it is given in all the radiology textbooks be very careful okay Okay, onion peel everyone knows, but we are special. Moth eaten appearance of the bone, cracked eyes appearance of the bone. Sun ray appearance of the bone, sun ray appearance of the bone, straightforward osteogenic sarcoma. Cord man's triangle, straightforward osteogenic sarcoma. Okay, then the patients have a raindrop skull. Raindrop skull is otherwise called multiple punched out lesions of the skull. Raindrop skull is otherwise called multiple punched out lesions of the skull. Multiple myeloma. Very important. Multiple myeloma, multiple punched out lesions. Otherwise called raindrop skull. Multiple myeloma. Okay. Yes. Punched out lesions. So the punched out lesion can be solitary also. Then pedicle sign. Pedicle sign. Okay, what do you mean by pedicle sign? When you take an AP view of the spine, you will see a beak-like thing with the spinous process. The pedicles, you can see it like two eyes. They are called pedicle sign. Okay, exactly in an X-ray, a beak-like thing will be like this. And here, two pedicles will be seen. Okay, so this is called, a this is normal. This is normal. If it is multiple myeloma, one side, the pedicle, you can't see. You can't see. Only one area can see you here. You, you are not able to see eye-like thing. So this pedicle sign is otherwise called winking owl. Winking owl sign. Winking owl sign. Pedicle sign is otherwise called winking owl sign. Okay. Then biconcave vertebra otherwise called codfish vertebra. The diagnosis is multiple myeloma. Biconcave vertebra, that is called codfish vertebra. The diagnosis is multiple myeloma. So, in multiple myeloma, I repeat, dear friends, what are the X ray findings you can expect? Punched out lesions, multiple punched out lesions, raindrop skull, a pedicle sign, a biconcave vertebra. Okay, yes. One more special point I want to tell you, dear friends. One more special point I want to tell you. And most of you may be knowing the answer, but it's my duty to just revise it for you. Punched out lesions in a bone. They are asked, not the skull. They are asked a question, punched out lesions of the bone. Search for eosinophilic granuloma first. Okay. Eosinophilic, eosinophilic granuloma first. Eosinophilic granuloma first. Multiple myeloma next. Another cause is there for punched out lesions of the bone, dear friends, and that is, unless otherwise we read, we can't answer, gout. Gout can cause punched out lesions in the bone. And this is called mortal's G sign. 
mortals g stands for gout g sign okay mortals g sign right so all these time honored standard mcqs in tumors we have seen yes we move on to that yeah again humpty number of ask question fallen fragment sign you look at the x-ray fallen fragment sign is a classical feature of you see here i am able to see this is upper end of humerus i am able to see a lytic lesion here i am able to see something a white a fallen a small piece of bone that is a fractured piece of bone the very peculiarity dear friends you please concentrate note there you see first you see there you see there yeah that small fragment you are seeing in middle no the very peculiarity dear friends it is in the dependent position when you make an x ray in standing position like that the fragment will be there you just make the patient upside down you take an x ray this fragment will go here in the dependent position okay that's why it's called fallen fragment sign fallen fragment sign is the classical feature of unicameral bone cyst unicameral bone cyst unicameral bone cyst is otherwise called classical bone cyst unicameral bone cyst is otherwise called classical bone cyst most common site is upper end of humerus why this is called unicameral bone cyst or is called classical bone cyst because there is another bone cyst which is called aneurysmal bone cyst okay there are two types of bone cyst one is called aneurysmal abc aneurysmal bone cyst another type is called ubc unicameral bone cyst unicameral bone cyst is the most common bone cyst that happens in a child so it's called classical bone cyst only in unicameral bone cyst you will get that fallen fragment don't get confused okay very clear yes look at the next beautiful huh, diagram a picture okay you see this yeah i will stand there you just see this is called snowstorm knee oh god wow what a question snowstorm knee okay like a snowstorm you see that now you see i will take this marking here yeah you're able to see there see the picture that is an arthroscopic image so snowstorm knee is seen via arthroscope not in x-ray not in ultrasound not in mri through arthroscope when you just put a keyhole you just put into a knee joint you are seeing you will see something like a snowstorm that's called snowstorm knee snowstorm knee what is the diagnosis in which situation it is seen you see i am able to see through arthroscope a snowstorm like thing i had taken this outside and kept it in a green color towel and able to see small 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 white small pieces like a snowstorm so this snowstorm knee is a classical feature of synovial chondromatosis synovial chondromatosis it's a synovial tumor synovial lining cell tumor synovial lining cell tumor synovial chondromatosis is the diagnosis is the word snowstorm knee because snowstorm appearance comes in many places in mcq dear friends snowstorm appearance of the lung x-ray finding fat embolism ards snowstorm appearance of the abdomen ultrasound finding ultrasound finding what is that hydratiform mole hydratiform mole okay like that no snowstorm appearance of the knee the diagnosis is synovial chondromatosis which is a synovial lining cell malignancy tumor what are they they are small small bits of synovium which have fallen from the main synovium and forms a loose body so multiple loose bodies in the knee joint that you are seeing those loose bodies multiple loose bodies it is it gives an appearance like a snowstorm and one very important thing dear friends you know pretty well the synovial lining cells are nourished by the synovial fluid am i right or wrong yes synovial lining cells are nourished by the synovial fluid these small small bits fall into the synovial fluid and it is floating it is totally it has detached from the main lining and it is floating even a detached floating that loose body 
can get nourished because it's floating in the synovial fluid only. So it can eat well and these loose body tend to grow. This increases in size. These small, small bits increases in size with time. Okay. So it's very, very interesting. So snowstorm appearance of the knee not asked many times. Okay. The answer is synovial chondromatosis. Multiple loose bodies. The first thing that should come to your mind, synovial chondromatosis. Then osteochondritis desiccans. Then minimal loose bodies, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. Loose bodies, three differential diagnoses should cross your mind, dear friends. Yes. Polka dot. Cordroy gene appearance. Classically seen. This is one lakh time repeated MCQ. Look at the diagram. When you see, I am, see the, I am seeing, I am finding the radiology. I am seeing the vertebral body. I am seeing the vertebral body. I am seeing multiple dots. They are called polka dot. Polka dot, no. Polka dot shirts. T-shirts. Polka dot T-shirts. Polka dot. Then, if I see the body of the vertebra, I am seeing linear lines like this. So, this is called cordroid gene appearance. You know, the gene span, no? Cordroid gene span. Old textbook. When I was doing my UG, my professor showed and I, I think the textbook, it was M. Nadrajan's old UG book. Instead of cordroid gene, he uses the word jail bar vertebra. Jail bar vertebra. Jail bar vertebra. So, cordroid gene, see, look at that like a jail bar. One, two, three, like a linear lines. Like a cordroid gene or a jail bar vertebra or polka dot appearance in the body of the vertebra classically seen in hemangioma hemangioma vascular tumor hemangioma the point i want to stress dear friends most common site of skeletal hemangioma is vertebrae most common site of skeletal hemangioma is vertebra right right now we'll move on to the even though this is a silly question, in one liner, I can't leave this question. If I leave this question, it's a sin. Most common organism causing acute osteomyelitis is. Okay. This is even a newborn baby will answer this. Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus. Right. The most common cause of Osteomyelitis, acute osteomyelitis. Generally, they ask, they are not use the word acute, chronic, subacute, most common cause of osteomyelitis. Always it is staphylococcus or yes, there is no doubt. Most common organism causing osteomyelitis in sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell patient, the patient is already a sickle cell patient, and the patient is developing osteomyelitis, especially this is caused by salmonella. Salmonella, okay, typhoid, that means typhoid, okay, salmonella typhi, that's the most common cause. One point I, I will stress, dear friends, the treatment we know for staphylococcal osteomyelitis, acute osteomyelitis, medical, salmonella osteomyelitis, that, oh, that it will not respond to medicine that easily. Mostly this is going for surgical drainage, it's going for surgical drainage, just, just keep it in back of your mind. And most common site of osteomyelitis in a bone. This is again an LKG question. So this is called, this part is called uh, epiphysis. This part is called metaphysis. This is called diaphysis. And everyone knows osteomyelitis is a disorder of metaphysis. The disorder of metaphysis. Osteomyelitis 99% happens only in metaphysis. Only in metaphysis. You know why this is common in metaphysis. Okay, why this osteomyelitis is common in metaphysis? Okay, you should know. There are six theories. At least you should know two theories. One is hairpin bend vessel theory. Hairpin bend vessel theory. In metaphysis, what happens? In diaphysis, in other places, the blood vessel, the interosseous blood vessel, blood vessel which is traversing through the bone is very straight is very straight in metaphysis the all the straight vessels are becoming like a hairpin bend becoming like a hairpin bend in the metaphysial area since hairpin bend bending happens in the vessel 
you know pretty well the spread of osteomyelitis is hematogenous through blood spread. So here the organism will come very fast once it reaches the metaphysis since there is hairpin bent vessels all the organism slows down. When the organism slows down the, the, blood, the blood circulation slows down. When the blood circulation because of hairpin bent the blood circulation slows down. Since the blood circulation slows down organism escapes from the site. Escapes from the stream. In diaphysis, the blood, the blood flow is very fast, so it can't escape. In metaphysis, because of hairpin bent vessels, since it becomes very sluggish, very slow, organism jumps out, it escapes. Okay, so this is called hairpin bend theory. This is called hairpin bend theory. This goes by a name. This is, if you want, you go by the name. This is called Trueta's theory. Trueta. Trueta's hypothesis. This is the one proven hypothesis. Number two, in whole bone when you take, in metaphysis, phagocytes are deficient. Phagocytes are deficient. Phagocytes are deficient in metaphysis. You know pretty well to kill any organism, what is important? Phagocytosis. So phagocytosis won't happen that easily in metaphysis. So, organism can jump out, it can grow there and this is called Hobo's Hypothesis, H-O-B-O, Hobo's Hypothesis. There are six hypotheses, dear friends, at least we should know these two. These are proven hypotheses. Prieta's Hypothesis and Hobo's Hypothesis explains very clearly why osteomyelitis is common in metaphysis. Okay, good. We'll go to the next one-liner. Earliest and best method to diagnose acute osteomyelitis. Earliest and best method to diagnose acute osteomyelitis. Okay. Very, very simple answer. You would have guessed. Answer is MRI. MRI. Earliest and best method to <coughs> diagnose osteomyelitis is MRI. Okay. X-ray is normal during first three weeks. You can't diagnose osteomyelitis before three weeks by x-ray. MRI is the earliest method. Even before MRI, the best method or the, the method is directly putting a needle, aspirating the pus and seeing direct visualization of pus. Since it's an invasive method, we won't do that. Already you are suspecting an inf infection. Why you want to put a poke with a needle and provoke the infection? Okay, so MRI is the answer in our paper. Okay, yes. Most common complication of acute osteomyelitis is most common cause of acute most common complication of acute osteomyelitis is chronic osteomyelitis. This is a catchy question. Chronic osteomyelitis. Okay, most common complication of acute osteomyelitis is chronic osteomyelitis. Yes, we have to hurry. Okay, we have to hurry. It is one and a half hours and we have seen only 33 questions. We have to, I have to rush. Septic arthritis of infancy is called, septic arthritis of infancy is called Tom Smith's arthritis. Okay, Tom Smith's arthritis. Septic arthritis of infancy is called Tom Smith's arthritis. What is the peculiarity of Tom Smith's arthritis? Any arthritis, no, what happens? The end result is ankylosis. For example, in an adult, a septic arthritis has happened in the knee joint. After healing, what happens? No, there will be range of movement of the knee joint is reduced because it go for ankylosis, fusion. It will go for fusion. The peculiarity of Tom Smith's arthritis, the joint will become hypermobile joint will become hypermobile. For that you should know which is the most common joint that is involved, hip joint. Septic arthritis of infancy, Tom Smith's arthritis, the most common joint involved is hip joint. What happens? The organism goes, erodes away the head. There is absolutely no head. The excision of head, it has eaten away the head. So in ball and socket type of joint, the ball is missing. So how will be the joint? It should be hypermobile. That's the end result of Tom Smith's arthritis. Okay. Most common site of Brody's Apsis and its treatment of choice. Brody's apsis is subacute osteomyelitis. Now, this is the correct definition. Some books are giving a wrong, they had classified Brody's under some other category. That is wrong. 
according to waldo ogle classification brodies comes under subacute osteomyelitis this is the right answer man subacute osteomyelitis this happens in the cancellous bone this happens in the cancellous bone it looks like in the x-ray it looks like an osteolytic lesion or tumor so that many times this brodies abscess is called brodies tumor so brodies abscess most common site of brodies abscess is upper tibia upper tibia treatment of choice is not medical surgical that's the point i want to stress one liner one liner i have no time to explain i want to explain a lot subacute osteomyelitis brodie's abscess okay so i will restrict my thing it is a subacute osteomyelitis most common site upper end of tibia treatment of choice is surgical drainage it won't respond to medicine okay yes name the two condition causes fibrous or incomplete ankylosis fibrous ankylosis or other is called incomplete ankylosis fusion see when you go and fuse when a patient is coming and they he is paying to an orthopedician and an orthopedician is fusing a joint that's called arthrodesis that's called arthrodesis when fusion happens naturally that is called ankylosis that is called ankylosis what are the two cause conditions causes fibrous ankylosis other is called incomplete ankylosis number 1 tuberculosis number 1 tuberculosis number 2 rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis one lakh time repeated mcq please concentrate two causes for fibrous or incomplete ankylosis tuberculosis and rheumatoid arthritis once you know when you know the causes for incomplete or fibrous ankylosis you should know a complete ankylosis or bony two causes for bony or complete ankylosis full ankylosis in fibrous ankylosis minimal pain will be there in bony ankylosis no pain will be there totally it is fused two causes for complete ankylosis septic arthritis septic arthritis this is other is called pyogenic osteomyelitis pyogenic osteomyelitis or septic arthritis one cause second cause ankylosing spondylitis two causes for bony ankylosis other is called complete ankylosis one is a pyogenic osteomyelitis or septic arthritis another is a ankylosing spondylitis yes what is the empirical drug of choice for acute osteomyelitis okay empirical drug of choice now everything is changed man dear friends everything is changed i am telling from the latest books okay so kindly concentrate on this i don't know which mcq guide you had studied and what what the answer you know okay if your answer your guess is right then well and good otherwise please concentrate okay now the book very clearly says the empirical drug of choice for acute osteomyelitis very clearly it says that more than 10 percentage of the indian population are already methicillin resistant staph aureus we know pretty well staph aureus is the most common cause it's the most common cause of organism is staphylococcus aureus and more than 10 percentage of our population is methicillin resistant staph aureus so the empirical drug of choice for acute osteomyelitis is vancomycin this is the right answer vancomycin next to vancomycin it is clindamycin vancomycin means many points i want to tell red man syndrome comes to my mind many side effect comes to my mind please read vancomycin is the drug of empirical drug of choice you should start the drug you take a blood culture send it for you sorry you take a pus culture send it for culture sensitivity it will take 3 to 4 days time b you give vancomycin so empirical drug of choice is vancomycin yes most common predominant early sign of pots paraplegia see i had not asked question of pots spine i am asking question of pots paraplegia pots paraplegia most common predominant early sign of pots paraplegia is ankle clonus is ankle clonus is ankle clonus okay yes how please have this in your mind many most commons will come in skeletal tuberculosis most common early sign of pots paraplegia is ankle clonus yes 
most preferred surgical approach for parts paraplegia parts paraplegia you should do decompression you should do decompression you have to do surgery paraplegia has happened so you have to do surgery you can't go on treating medically okay so it is called middle path regime is there sm tulis middle path regime in detailed part skeletal tuberculosis alone when you see my main recording it will go on 1 hour 20 minutes okay so skeletal tuberculosis alone many points are there so you can't go on treating with medically paraplegia has happened you have to do surgery what are the three indications for surgery one paraplegia has developed otherwise muscle power is is gradually it is decreasing you should do surgery third you have started on good medication correct medication no response for three months you have to do surgery for for this neurological thing so parts paraplegia what are the approach many approaches are there i am not going to tell all the most preferred approach is called anterior decompression anterior approach please register this in your mind because this question have been asked four times anterior decompression They will confuse you with posterior, lateral, anterolateral, lateral, many things. So, anterior decompression preferred. Okay. Yes. Most common site of part spine. We all know skeletal tuberculosis. The most common site is vertebra. Most common site is vertebra. In vertebra, which is the most common site of part spine is D12. Is the most common. 12th thoracic vertebra, most common. Next to that, L1. Why D12? This is the most weight bearing vertebra. Most weight bearing vertebra. Okay. Most weight bearing vertebra. Right. D12 is the most common site of parts spine. Earliest radiological feature of parts spine. What is the earliest radiological feature of parts spine? Answer is narrowing of the intervertebral disc space the earliest radiological sign of parts paraplegia a sorry parts spine is narrowing of the intervertebral disc space okay yes earliest now i asked a question earliest clinical sign of parts paraplegia now i am asking earliest clinical sign of parts spine earliest clinical see if they ask the question instead of sign if they ask the question earliest symptom you can answer low backache very simple earliest sign of parts paraplegia is loss of normal lumbar and loss of loss of normal Lumbar lordosis. Loss of normal lumbar lordosis is the earliest sign. Gibbous, all those things comes little later, man. Okay. So, this is the earliest clinical sign of parts spine is loss of normal lumbar lordosis. Okay. This is what is what we will do this by. I'm, I, I have no time to explain. Please follow. This is elicited by what is called a wall test. This loss of normal lumbar lordosis is elicited by a wall test. Okay. So, even though I don't have a time, see, I, how can I go to the next question? I will explain. You just go st and stand on the wall, showing your back to the wall like this. Normally, you can insinuate your finger like this because there is lumbar lordosis. When there is loss of lumbar lordosis, you can't insinuate your fingers and that is called a wall test. Because why this is happening, loss of lumbar lordosis is happening, that is happening because of paraspinal muscle spasm. So, the lumbar spine instead of that curvature, it will become erect. Okay, good. Wandering acetabulum is a classical feature of, okay, in image base also it is there. Just you see, wandering acetabulum is a classical clinical feature of TB hip. I am not going to explain this, please go go through that in image based session in youtube it is already there wandering acetabulum this is otherwise called traveling acetabulum wandering acetabulum is otherwise called traveling acetabulum is a classical feature of tb hip like that triple deformity of knee is a classical feature of tb knee tuberculosis knee 
what are the three deformities that are happening tibia is shifted posteriorly sorry tibia is dislocated posteriorly shifted laterally rotated externally what are the three things that are happening in the tibia tibia is dislocated posteriorly shifted laterally rotated externally posterior lateral external okay so three things are happening that's called triple deformity that's called triple deformity this is because of tightening of the iliotibial band because of tightening of the iliotibial band so triple deformity one cause tb knee dear friends next cause polio 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 also causes tightening of the <coughs> tensor tfl tensor fascia lata okay yes what is ponset's arthritis what is ponset's arthritis ponset's arthritis look at the finger ponset's arthritis is tubercular arthritis tubercular arthritis resembling rheumatoid arthritis tubercular arthritis resembling rheumatoid arthritis one second i will explain usually in tuberculosis what joints are involved man large joints spine hip knee shoulder okay so these are the joints in rheumatoid what joints are involved small joints especially hand joints metacarpals so when tuberculous arthritis involving the small joints you will think it is a case of rheumatoid you will investigate in the line of rheumatoid finally it will turn to be a tuberculous that tubercular arthritis resembling rheumatoid arthritis is called ponset's arthritis so this goes by a name tuberculous rheumatism this is other is called tuberculous rheumatism rheumatism okay tuberculous rheumatism yes so five classically you see wow what a picture you are able to see tophi that red color swollen great toe tophi is accumulation of what it's accumulation of mono sodium urate crystal mono sodium urate crystals what do you mean by tophi tophi is accumulation of monosodium urate crystal surrounded by foreign body giant cells and macrophages here in the sino when you aspirate here there will be monosodium urate crystals which is surrounded by macrophages and foreign body giant cell that accumulation that total that mass is called a tophi most common site is grade 2 base of the grade 2 okay very painful condition yes definitive diagnosis of gout is made by instead of using all the serum uric acid level all those things the diagnosis is direct aspiration of the synovial fluid and you are seeing birefringent monosodium urate crystal on the microscope okay direct visualization of monosodium urate crystal in the synovial fluid aspiration and it shows a birefringence that is the 100% definitive diagnosis of gout yes drug of choice for acute gout many things will come to your mind answer is nsaid answer is nsaids okay many things will come to your mind i am telling you because this is a one liner i should tell it in one line drug of choice for acute gout nsaid non steroidal anti inflammatory drug okay in the same thing drug of choice for chronic gout allopurinol which is a xanthine oxidase what do you know it is an uricosteric agent allopurinol okay that is the drug of choice for chronic gout in acute gout it won't act the next question you may expect is drug of choice for gout with allopurinol allergy this is happening in many patients they many many practically many of our citizens they can't withstand allopurinol allergic so if it is allopurinol allergic acid all have allopurinol allergic chronic gout what is the drug of choice okay proben acid proben acid 
Sthir Raghav choice. Okay. In gout, you can expect all these questions. In gout, I told you punched out lesions of the bone, mortals, G sign. Crystal deposition in pseudo gout is what is that? Crystal deposition in pseudo gout is <clears throat> one minute. Arthritis mutilans occurs in arthritis mutilans occurs in yeah yes psoriatic arthritis psoriatic arthritis psoriatic arthritis arthritis mutilans happens in psoriatic arthritis okay yes so because <clears throat> many uh, I had. Uh, see, since I am teaching in the end, uh, for your NEET PG, I have to go through most of the MCQ books. It's my duty to do. Okay. They had given this arthritis mutilants in some other area. Please don't follow. Arthritis mutilants. Okay. Arthritis mutilants means it is psoriatic arthritis. Okay. It is psoriatic arthritis. They had given some infective, some other condition. I don't want to tell the wrong answer. So, arthritis mutilans happens in psoriatic arthritis. Okay. Yes. Drug of choice for psoriatic arthritis is. Drug of choice for psoriatic arthritis is. If it is psoriatic arthritis, drug of choice is methotrexate. Methotrexate. You all know methotrexate should be given only once a week. It is 7.5 mg once a week. And it causes severe folic acid deficiency. So, always this should be supplemented with folinic acid. Folinic acid. Okay. Folinic acid. Mary Strumpel disease. What do you mean by Mary Strumpel disease? The name may sound something very new and it may... Oh God. Mary Strumpel's disease is nothing but ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing Spondylitis. Mary Strumpel disease is nothing but ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. Ankylosing spondylitis means you should know certain things common in men. HLA B27. First area affected is sacroiliac joint. And in the criteria there comes restriction of uh, uh, chest movements, chest expansion. Okay. Right. So sacroiliitis main cause is Ankylosing spondylitis, Mary Strumpel disease, ankylosing. The very peculiar thing, anything, no, uh, sacroiliitis is causing sacroiliitis. Main, main majority of the arthritis, what should happen? Rest should, will relieve the pain, movement will worsen the pain. This happens reverse in ankylosing spondylitis. Early morning, patient will be having pain. When they start working, the pain will come down. Okay, it is ankylosing spondylitis, yes. And... Uh, Famous orthopedic clinical teaching is when somebody complains of low back ache, don't think of rheumatoid arthritis. Think of ankylosing spondylitis. Okay. Don't think of rheumatoid arthritis, low back ache. Rheumatoid arthritis usually will not present to you with low back ache. Yes. Stills disease. What is Stills disease? Stills disease is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Stills disease is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So, Stills disease is juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It's called Stills disease. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And once you know the Stills disease, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, you should know what is Felty syndrome. Several times repeated ortho MCQ. What is the triad of Felty syndrome? Felty syndrome, Felty syndrome the triad is splenomegaly. Splenomegaly. Neutropenia. Chronic rheumatoid arthritis. So, what do you mean by Felty syndrome? It is splenomegaly, neutropenia, chronic rheumatoid arthritis. That's, this is the triad, classical triad of Felty syndrome. Yes. Periarticular osteoporosis. Whenever you come across the word periarticular osteoporosis, the, you look at the x ray, man. You see, very, it shows two important findings. I will tell you, you concentrate on the x-ray. Joint space narrowing is there. 
this joint space narrowing is equal on medial side and lateral side so this is called symmetrical joint space narrowing symmetrical joint space narrowing symmetrical joint space narrowing second thing when you see articular means joint area around the articular area there is osteopenia or osteoporosis periarticular osteoporosis the only diagnosis symmetrical joint space narrowing periarticular osteoporosis the only diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis answer is rheumatoid arthritis other way around asymmetrical joint space narrowing the diagnosis is osteoarthritis that's the only difference radiologically symmetrical joint space narrowing a word comes he is meaning rheumatoid arthritis asymmetrical joint space narrowing he is meaning osteoarthritis joints that are not involved in rheumatoid arthritis joints that are not involved in rheumatoid arthritis okay because you know most of the joints are involved in rheumatoid arthritis you should know what are the two joints that are not at all involved in rheumatoid arthritis one is distal interphalangeal joint dip number two sacroiliac joint please take down very important rheumatoid will involve all the joints except dip and the sacroiliac joint that's why i said when somebody is presenting with low back ache it is not rheumatoid arthritis it is not rheumatoid arthritis something else yes keplon syndrome look at the x-ray how oh, beautiful i am able to see here no multiple right i am able to see multiple nodules multiple nodules so keplon syndrome is rheumatoid arthritis plus coal workers pneumoconiosis Kaplan syndrome is rheumatoid arthritis with <coughs> coal workers pneumoconiosis first line drug for active rheumatoid arthritis any guess it is like your uh, what i said no in the previous thing treatment of choice for acute gout nsaid like that first line drug for active rheumatoid arthritis is steroids they will give confuse you by giving methotrexate nsaid uh, disease modifying anti rheumatoid drugs all those things first line like for active when rheumatoid arthritis is active you just make it inactive by starting the patient on steroids okay drug of choice for acute gout nsaid drug of choice for active rheumatoid arthritis steroids yes the joints not involved in osteoarthritis joints that not involved in osteoarthritis wrist practically speaking i won't accept with this but all mc that the textbooks in mcq angle it is telling like this you should know till we get a pg certain things we should know wrist second thing elbow joints that are not involved in osteoarthritis is wrist and elbow okay squaring of petal is the classical feature of squaring of petal is the classical feature of you see that's why i had given you two images dear friends and given you two images okay classical images this is a normal petal you just concentrate on the petal you concentrate on the petal it is somewhat a pear shaped something like this you see the shape okay again i will rub it see the shape okay you see here petal la is squared i will i will rub it you just see petal la is squared classical squaring of petal la what is the only diagnosis hemophilic arthritis hemophilic arthritis okay squaring of petal la is seen in hemophilic arthritis okay when you read harrison very carefully the word under um, in heme arthrosis topic he he writes like this apart from trauma the most common cause of heme arthrosis knee is hemophilia so what is mean most common cause is trauma in the most common non traumatic cause for heme arthrosis knee is hemophilia so hemophilia chronic hemophilia okay so the hemophilia you, you know about hemophilia hemophilia factor all those things there is no time 
classically that will show you squared petal law so in radiology mcq or ortho mcq they are asking a question squaring of petal law is seen in answer is hemophilic arthritis what are they okay so this okay again i have to run like a machine right what are they these are osteochondritis these are osteochondritis named osteochondritis see each and everything full name i can't write i will tell you stinting larsen johansen's disease is osteochondritis of the petella osteochondritis of the petella osgood slater's disease is osteochondritis of the tibial tuberosity tibial tuberosity severs disease is osteochondritis of the calcaneum hawkins disease is osteochondritis of the talus Freiberg's disease is osteochondritis of the second metatarsal. Eileen, I S L E N E, pronounced as Eileen. Eileen is the osteochondritis of the fifth metatarsal. Hayes is osteomyelitis of the head of humerus. Head of humerus. Panas is osteochondritis of the capitulum. Precious is osteochondritis of the caphoid. Schuermann's is osteochondritis of the vertebral body. Okay, so I one more time I will tell you. Okay, osteochondritis, there there is avascular necrosis, osteochondritis, osteochondritis desiccans, traction epiphysitis. Many terminologies will be there. The most accepted nowadays in 2023 it is called osteochondritis. Osteochondritis of the thin of petal is called thinning Larsen Johansson. Tibial tuberosity is called Osgood Slater. Calcaneum is called Sever. Talus is called Hawkins. Second metatarsal is called Freiberg's. Fifth metatarsal is called Eileen. A head of humerus is called Hayes. Capitulum is called Panus. Scaphoid is proximal pole of scaphoid because you know pretty well the radial artery enters through the distal pole. Most common site of fracture of scaphoid is the waist. So proximal pole will go for avascular necrosis. That's called precious. Vertebral body is called Schuermann's. It's called Schuermann's. Yes. Okay, I have to rush. Most common fracture of newborn. Okay, one liner. Okay, I, there is hereafter. No, I should tell the answer alone, right? Most common fracture of newborn. It's almost two hours, man. So I have to finish. Most common fracture of newborn. Clavicle. Best treatment for clavicle fracture is conservative. No surgery. That's the meaning. Conservative means no surgery. What you will do? Figure of 8 plus cuff and collar. This is the best management. Okay. The reasons and all, there is no time to explain. Most common type of shoulder dislocation. Three types of shoulder dislocations are there. Anterior, posterior, inferior. Okay. Three types are there. Most common type of shoulder dislocation is always anterior. In anterior, there are three subtypes, preglenoid, subglenoid, sorry, preglenoid, subcoracoid, subclavicular, okay. So, this is again preglenoid, subcoracoid, subclavicular, okay. Three types are there in anterior. Among these three, the most common is preglenoid. So, how to consolidate this into MCQ, the most common type of shoulder dislocation is Preglenoid type of anterior shoulder dislocation. This is the most common type. This is the most common type. Treatment of choice for anterior shoulder dislocation. Many methods are there. The method is called K-O-C-H-E-R apostrophe S. Cocher's method. Some professors used to pronounce it as Cocker. So this is we used to pronounce it as Cocher's method. This is called Team technique. This is called team technique. Traction, e traction, external rotation, adduction, medial rotation. Traction, external rotation, adduction, medial rotation. That's called Koch's method. And that is the method of choice to reduce shoulder dislocation. Classical X-ray signs of posterior shoulder dislocations are, you look at here, two signs are there, right? I am able to see this is a normal shoulder joint man this is head this is your this is head of humerus glenoid cavity 
here I am able to see the glenoid cavity empty totally able to see the glenoid cavity empty totally right so this is called vacant glenoid vacant glenoid otherwise called empty glenoid sign empty glenoid sign when you look the head of the humerus it looks exactly like a 40 watts old Philips bulb so this is otherwise called light bulb sign light bulb sign so two named signs of shoulder dislocation and both happens only in posterior shoulder dislocation there is no named sign in anterior shoulder dislocation there is no named sign in inferior shoulder dislocation but radiologically two named signs are there both are reserved only for posterior shoulder dislocation one is called a vacant glenoid sign another is called a uh, vacant glenoid is otherwise called empty glenoid sign otherwise this is called a light bulb sign this is called a light bulb sign yes luxatio erecta luxatio erecta luxatio erecta is otherwise called luxatio erecta what is luxatio erecta this is nothing but inferior shoulder dislocation inferior shoulder dislocation is called luxatio erecta because there are three types of shoulder dislocation dear friends anterior posterior inferior the most common type is preglenoid anterior least common type is inferior but inferior is called luxatio erecta you know why the patient's attitude no head has dislocated from the socket that is from the glenoid cavity and it's pushed inferior to the glenoid cavity so it is like that so what happened patient comes like this patient comes with an attitude like this when you take an x-ray the head of the humerus is erected so the sorry the shaft of the humerus is erected so this is called luxatio erecta this is called luxatio erecta rarest type but it go, goes by a name like this luxatio erecta right when you see luxatio erecta when you want to diagnose that clinically in anterior shoulder dislocation humpty number number of uh, physical signs are there like your dugas test brian sign hamilton ruler's test what is that regimen batch test callaway's test apprehension test so many main name tests are there in inferior shoulder dislocation only one test is there that is what's that you make the patient like this ask him to flex the elbow just pull the elbow down if it's an inferior shoulder dislocation here you can see a groove like thing is formed here you see here exactly you see here okay you're able to see you're able to see here a dimple like thing a groove like thing that is called the sulcus sign that is called sulcus sign the only named sign of uh, inferior shoulder dislocation is sulcus sign yes best treatment for proximal humerus fracture when they ask a question like this best treatment for three part okay you know the nears classification nears one part two part three part four part please what are the parts how it's called apart please refer that in my uh, main session okay there is no time to explain if it is one part fracture treatment of choice is just one part fracture is immobilization in an arm sling don't do conservative management if it is two part fracture it you have to reduce it and fix it with a k wire if it's a three part fracture treatment of choice is with what is called a pillow split pillow split look at the plate three parts are there you are reducing putting and putting with a plate and screw this is called phyllos phyllos is an abbreviation dear friends proximal humerus interlocking system proximal humerus interlocking system that's called a phyllos plate proximal humerus interlocking system phyllos plate is the treatment of choice if it is four part if it is four part you can't do anything except joint replacement that's called arthroplasty arthroplasty i completed the treatment of choice for proximal humerus i repeat once again one part fracture conservative two part fracture k wire fixation three part fracture phyllos plating four part fracture shoulder arthroplasty shoulder replacement what is holstein levis fracture what is holstein levis fracture you see here you see holstein levis fracture is fracture shaft of humerus fracture shaft of humerus happening in the lower third lower third not in the middle third in the lower third 
and it should be an oblique fracture. It should be lower third shaft of fracture. The pattern should be oblique. More than this, the most important thing associated with radial nerve injury. What is Holstein Lewis fracture? Lower third oblique fracture of shaft of humerus associated with radial nerve injury is called Holstein Lewis fracture. So, this is an orthopedic emergency. Okay. Yes. Most common type of elbow dislocation. We all know what is the most common type of shoulder dislocation. Most common type of elbow dislocation, there is no doubt it is posterior. It is posterior. Posterior is subdivided into posteromedial, posterolateral. If they ask a question like this, we are in trouble. The most common type is posterolateral. Posterolateral. <clears throat> That's the answer. Posterolateral type of uh, elbow dislocation is the most common type of dislocation. Four radiological signs of supracondyla fracture. See, I can't leave all these things. That's why, okay. So, I know it is jam-packed, but I can't leave. Right? You see, what are the four radiological signs? Just I will write the sign name alone. Teardrop sign. Okay. You are able to see a teardrop like thing you see here. Okay. Right. A teardrop like thing. Right. See I will erase this. You see. Teardrop. This is normal. If there is supracondylar fracture, the teardrop is disturbed. Okay, teardrop is, sorry, at this level it is disturbed, teardrop is disturbed. So, teardrop sign is disturbed. This is the first thing. Teardrop sign is disturbed. <clears throat> okay, teardrop sign is disturbed. Number two, the second sign, the proximal fragment when you see, serrated, it is like a thing. So, this is called fishtail sign. In image based, very detailed discussion is there in this. You go and see fishtail sign. The third sign is crescent sign. Crescent sign. Right? And the fourth thing. Okay, here I am not able to get this. So, the fourth thing is called <coughs> pad pad sign. Four named signs of supracondylar fracture, radiological signs, teardrop sign disturbed, fishtail sign seen, crescent sign seen, fat pad sign seen. Okay. Yeah. What is Jupiter fracture? What is Jupiter fracture? Jupiter fracture is lateral condyle fracture, lateral epicondyle here. Lateral condyle fracture in a child is called Jupiter fracture. Lateral epicondyle fracture lateral epicondyle fracture in a child is called jupiter fracture lateral epicondyle fracture in a child okay elbow it's called jupiter's fracture okay nurse made elbow is it is nothing but pulled elbow nurse made elbow is nothing but pulled elbow most common age is between one to four years most common age is between one to four years most common age Usually, it is rare after 5. That's what the book says. After 5, it's rare. 1 to 4. What is it? It is slippage of the radial head from the annular ligament. That is called pulled elbow. Other is called nursemaid elbow. Yes. So, nursemaid elbow means another MCQ that is coming to your mind. Minor's elbow. Minor's elbow is other is called student's elbow. That's called olecranon bursitis. Tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis. Golfer's elbow. It is medial epicondylitis. Javelin thrower's elbow, triceps tendinitis. Okay, elbow MCQs. I repeat once again, dear friends. Nursemaid elbow is called pulled elbow. Student's elbow, other is called minor's elbow, is olecranon bursitis. L tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. Golfer's elbow is medial epicondylitis. Javelin thrower's elbow is triceps tendinitis. Okay, yes. Treacherous fracture is nothing but Montegia. Okay, nothing but Montegia's fracture. Okay, what is Montegia's fracture? Fracture upper third ulna with radial head subluxation. That is called treacherous 
fracture that is called a Montegius fracture. What are the two fractures of necessity in ortho? Okay, one fra fracture of necessity everyone knows. Number one fracture of necessity, it is lateral epicondyle fracture in a child. This is called Jupiter. This is called Jupiter. Number two fracture of necessity, Galeasi. Galeasi fracture is called fracture of necessity. What do you mean by fracture of necessity? When this fracture happens, 100% surgery is necessary. So, it is called fracture of necessity. Okay, right. Most common complication of Coley's fracture is, why I frame this, even though this sounds very silly, why I frame this MCQ, easily we will be slipped. Why? Okay, because a lesson, a very hard, hard lesson which I learned, this was my entrance MCQ. I made a mistake because no, when somebody asks a question, most common complication of Coley's fracture, the thing that will cross our mind reflexly is malunion. Yes or no? Dinner folk deformity, malunion. Malunion is the second common complication. Most common complication of Coley's fracture is finger stiffness. Finger stiffness. Okay. Second common complication is malunion. Right. What is gamekeeper's thumb or skier's thumb? Okay. First of all, you should know who is a gamekeeper. Who is a gamekeeper? Okay. Gamekeeper means don't think uh, it's a good job. I, I can say it is It's not a very good job. Nowadays, all those things are er 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 eradicated from the society. Old British era. Okay. Gamekeepers means they had a peculiar thing. They will go, they will shoot the animals. They will enjoy that. Okay. They will enjoy that shooting, right? For for that purpose, they used to rare animals like rabbit, deer, innocent animals. The guy who is maintaining that animal in the animal husbandry, he is called a gamekeeper. He is called a gamekeeper. And when he wants to kill the animal, he used to do with his in between the thumb and the index finger, he used to catch the neck of the animal. He used to do like this on the ground so that the neck will get dislocated and the poor animal will die. He used to do like that. Repeatedly since he, he was doing like that, there will be injury to the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. Ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb will become lax. It will get damaged. That is called gamekeeper's thumb. Gamekeeper's thumb is injury to the ulnar collateral. Then why this skiers, game, game, gamekeepers, two things are there. In skiers also, this, those two skiing, skiers also, they are prone for this injury. When this ulnar collateral ligament injury is acute, it is called skier's thumb. When it is a chronic one, it is called gamekeeper's thumb. That is the only difference. Both are almost same. Both the answer is the same. Okay. It is ulnar collateral ligament injury of the thumb. Amount of blood loss in pelvic fracture. These are numerical MCQs. Names and numbers. Dear friends, we can't guess. You should know the fact. Once you had read... Okay, you are listening to me, you know, you won't forget. You say the amount of blood loss in pelvic fracture is 1 to 3 liters. 1 to 3 liters. This is the correct answer. 1 to 3 liters. Up to 3 liters. Massive blood loss. Fracture shaft of femur. This is fracture femur. It should be correctly shaft. Fracture shaft of femur. The blood loss is maximum up to 1.5 liters. That's the difference. Pelvic fracture... 3 liters, up to 3 liters. This is 1.5 liters. What is Melgagni fracture? What is Melga Melgagni's fracture? Melgagni's fracture is the type of pelvic fracture. What is that? Because of vertical shear, totally one side, no? Totally it is shared and it is asymmetrical. Fracture becomes asymmetrical. That is called Melgagnian fracture. Straddle fracture is bilateral superior and inferior pubic ramae fracture okay it is bilateral superior and inferior pubic ramae fracture pubic ramae fracture okay right bilateral what what do i mean that please careful straddle is a worst type what i can say both sides right and left both sides superior pubic ramae and inferior pubic ramae are fractured then it's called a straddle fracture it's called a straddle fracture 
these are all named fractures which type of neck of femur fracture more prone for avascular necrosis we all know the most common complication of fracture neck of femur is avascular necrosis plus non-union this is the most common complication okay book says that however good an orthopedician 40 percent can go for this only one book says 85 percent will go for this both are great books so i am giving you both the uh, statistics so overall without doubt the most common complication of fracture neck of femur is a vascular necrosis and non-union this is the most common complication anatomically non-union uh, neck of femur have been divided into many types subcapital transcervical basic cervical like that so anatomical type the most common type of fracture neck of femur that is more prone for AV, a vascular necrosis is subcapital unfortunately this is the most common type okay subcapital is the most common type and this is the most common type that undergoes highest chance of going for a vascular necrosis okay yes which is the most common and rarest complication of intertrochanteric fracture this is very straightforward most common complication of intertrochanteric fracture is malunion rarest complication of intertrochanteric fracture is rarest complication is non-union very rare see both are happening in the hip man neck most common complication is non-union intertrochanteric fracture the most common complication is malunion rarest is non-union you know the reason why because neck is intracapsular trochanter is extracapsular intracapsular it has synovial fluid inside that synovial fluid has an enzyme called lysine so it will not allow blood clot to neck of femur fracture is happening once a fracture has happened it will go for fracture hematoma fracture hematoma mean fracture hematoma once it has formed it is the foundation for callus then once callus is formed it will go for consolidation remodeling this is how a fracture heals the synovial fluid lysine will not allow the blood to form a clot fracture hematoma can't be formed because of lysine in the synovial fluid once there is no clot no hematoma how a callus can form that's why it's going for non-union that's why it's going for non-union this is outside the joint capsule no synovial fluid is going for malunion okay very simple yes see in what are all the situations vascular sign of norath is positive just i'm going to tell i'll go to the next mcq vascular sign of norath causes posterior dislocation hip Developmental dysplasia hip, fracture neck of femur, Tom Smith's arthritis, excision arthroplasty, excision arthroplasty. These are the five conditions. You will see positive vascular sign of Norath. What do you mean by positive vascular sign of Norath? You are palpating the femoral artery. On the affected side, you are not able to see the feel the femoral artery, or femoral artery is felt very feebly. Then it's called positive vascular sign of Norath. Why we are able to see femoral artery very, very prominently, we easily we are able to see because underlying there is head of femur is there, a bony structure is there, a bony support is there underlying. So when you press the femoral artery, underlying bony support is there, so it is you are able to feel the pulse easily. If the bony support is lost, when you press, no, the vessel will go inside, there is no underlying bony support, so you can't feel the pulse. This is called vascular sign of Norath. What are the causes? Post dislocation hip, development dysplasia hip. Fracture neck of femur, Tom Smith's arthritis, excision arthroplasty. This is called girdle stones excision arthroplasty. This is done for tuberculosis hip. Okay. In which type of hip dislocation, head of femur is palpable perrectally. You are doing perrectal examination. You something comes up and obstructing that. You are seeing a bony mass and that is the head of the femur. Answer is central dislocation hip. Central dislocation hip. Because dislocation hip is of three types, man. Posterior, anterior, central. Posterior dislocation, head of uh, head of femur is below the acetabulum, anterior above the in front of the acetabulum. In central, what happens? No, head of femur will go pierce the 
floor of the acetabulum. It pierces the go the the roof and floor of the acetabulum so that the head will enter into the pelvic cavity so that when whenever you are doing a perrectal examination it is seen. Okay, yes. X-ray view of choice to visualize patella. It is not AP lateral. Okay, you have to flex like this and pass the beam from above. Keep the film down. This is called axial view. Otherwise, this is called skyline view. Skyline view. This is the view of choice to visualize patella. Okay, you will not miss a, even a cracked fracture in that. What do you mean by aviator's fracture? What do you mean by aviator's fracture? During crash landing, if there is a bar in the seat, in the flight, the bar in the seat, middle portion of the foot is hit against the bar, this will go and cause fracture neck of talus and this is called aviator's fracture. Fracture neck of talus, that is called aviator's fracture. Most common tarsal bone to be fractured without most common carpal bone to be fractured scaphoid. Most common tarsal bone to be fractured is calcaneum. There is no doubt. Calcaneum. And the classical axial view of calcaneum is called Harris view. This is the x-ray view of choice. Okay. X-ray view of choice. Calcaneal fracture. In calcaneal fracture, it's a must you should take a CT scan. Otherwise, it will cheat you. Because only CT scan will tell you whether is there is any intraarticular extension or not. Okay. Classification of calcaneum is there. Sanders classification. Okay. In uh, what is uh, what is that? Uh, 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 SX Lopresti classification. Many names are there. Okay. You just please go through. Bimalleolar fracture. Both the medial malleolar and lateral malleolar are gone. This is called Potts fracture. Potts fracture. Trimalleolar fracture. Medial malleolar, lateral malleolar, posterior malleolar. This is called cotton fracture. It's called cotton fracture. Okay. Yes. Identify the following metatarsal fractures. See, I am seeing a fracture in base of the fifth metatarsal. The fracture is definitely outside the joint. It is not extending into the joint. It is outside the joint. So, this is called the classical Jones fracture. I am seeing a fracture in the base of the fifth metatarsal. Again, slowly it is extending into the joint. So, this is called pseudo Jones fracture. Purely extraarticular, it is Jones and it's intraarticular, it's called pseudo Jones. I am able to see fracture in the fifth metatarsal. It's an oblique fracture involving the shaft. This is called dancer's fracture. I am seeing fracture in the second metatarsal neck. This is called March fracture. All the metatarsal fractures are over. Okay. Yes. What is Jefferson's fracture? Jefferson's fracture is burst fracture body of T1 atlas burst fracture body of atlas is called jefferson okay so it is a harmful or harmless it is harmless fracture why it is involving only the body of the first cervical vertebra body of the first cervical vertebra burst fracture body of the first jefferson so what happens no severe pain the neck will be there so patient to our op will come i had seen many cases they will come, they will lift the mandible with their hand like this and they will come to the OP, sir. When they leave, ah, severe pain will be there. So, they lift. Okay, this is called Jefferson's fracture. So, that hard cervical collar we will give. Okay, that is the treatment. So, this is Jefferson's fracture. If there is fracture of the second cervical vertebra, C2, this is called hangman. This is a dangerous fracture. Okay, yes. Most common cause of kyphosis. Most common cause of kyphosis. Okay, opposite to lordosis, kyphosis, okay, hunchback, kyphosis, most common cause of kyphosis. When an MCQ appears like this, search what age they had given. If it is adolescence, young adults or adolescents, most common cause of kyphosis is postural. Postu postural. The second common cause is sure man. Sure man's, I told you, it is the osteochondritis of the vertebral body. Sure man's disease. So, postural position. Postural is the most common cause of kyphosis in young adolescents. The second cause is sure man's. The most common cause of kyphosis in old age, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. 
okay then you should be able to differentiate what do you mean by a knuckle gibbous kyphus you are seeing a single vertebral spinous process okay you are seeing prominence of single spinous process of the vertebra in the thoracic spine mostly it is called knuckle you are able to palpate two spinous process as a hump that is called knuckle diffuse pro prominence of the spinous process is called kyphus that's the difference okay all these things are related with the spinous process especially thoracic vertebra in single the prominence of single spinous process is called a knuckle prominence of two or three spinous process is called a gibbous very common in tuberculosis gibbous prominence of diffusely all the spinous process it is called kyphus okay gold standard investigation for acl injury is there is no doubt dear friends mri there is no doubt mri but once they had asked in aims i had seen okay mri is sensitive uh, for acl that's okay but once they had asked a question diagnostic arthroscopy when there is something like that in the choice the scopy is definitely superior to mri because it is directly visualizing usually we won't do why we are telling mri is preferable it's not invasive less expensive no chance of infection okay so mri mri should be the answer if in the choice best way some diagnostic arthroscopy is there they are hooking for that so you should change your mind and tick diagnostic arthroscopy and come out the gold standard clinical test for acl injury there are two tests anterior dryas latchmans the gold standard is always latchman latchmans is the best clinical test and the reason there is no time but i will tell in 10 10 sec on two seconds i will tell you latchmans no 30 degree flexion is enough in anterior dryas you should flex to 90 degree so that will hurt the patient more number 1 number 2 latchmans will be positive even if there is associated Uh, medial meniscal injury posterior horn of medial meniscus anterior dryas sometimes will show you negative if it is also acl is associated with posterior horn of medial meniscal injury that's called door step phenomena kindly refer my main recording everything with diagram it's there terrible trade of oh don't know you okay that's the pronunciation oh don't know you okay that's the i it's an irish word ireland word irish word oh don't know you what is terrible trade of oh don't know you number 1 acl injury plus number 2 medial meniscal injury plus number 3 medial collateral ligament injury mcl injury in the same knee at the same time the patient is having acl injury plus medial meniscal injury plus medial collateral ligament injury that is called terrible triad of knee other is called unhappy triad of knee this is called terrible triad of oh don't know you okay yes identify the fracture identify the fracture see i think you will be able to see a fracture here you will see a small chip that area that yellow dot i will i will erase that now you see small chip this is called a segond fracture that's called a segond fracture expected question dear friends i am expecting this for past 2 3 years it's not appearing this time it should come segond fracture segond whenever you see a segond fracture it's a indirect evidence that acl is gone when acl acl you can't see in the x ray man it should come here acl you can't see x ray when acl is gone it will tether the capsule on the lateral ligaments so it comes the avulsion fracture the lateral tip of the tibial condyle and that's called segond fracture so segond fracture is an indirect evidence of acl injury godfrey sign is a clinical sign to diagnose godfrey sign you look at this very very classically you are able to see here okay 90 degree flexion you are able to see sag in the tibial tuberosity is pulled down so godfrey sign is positive in posterior cruciate ligament injury posterior cruciate ligament injury this is called godfrey sign godfrey sign is otherwise called gravity sign otherwise called sag sign okay so godfrey sign or sag sign yes now most let us go yes 
like a electric train like a bullet train you should go okay most common nerve injuries i will tell you i can't write everything just i am going to tell from here after so i will tell most common nerve injury in fracture clavicle is medial cord of brachial plexus especially ulnar nerve most common nerve injury in proximal humerus axillary nerve most common nerve injury in shaft of humerus fracture radial nerve most common nerve injury in supracondylar fracture anterior interstitial branch of median nerve most common nerve injury in elbow dislocation median nerve most common nerve injury in montagias fracture posterior interstitial nerve most common nerve injury in hook of hamet deep branch of ulnar nerve most common nerve in wrist injury median nerve most common nerve injury in posterior dislocation hip sciatic nerve most common nerve injury in adh femoral nerve most common nerve head of fibula common peroneal nerve okay i am developing dyspnea once again for your sake i will tell you clavicle ulnar ulnar branch of the medial middle cord of brachial plexus proximal humerus axillary shaft of humerus radial supracondylar anterior interstitial branch of median elbow dislocation is median montagia fracture posterior interstitial nerve hook of hamid deep branch of ulnar nerve wrist injury any wrist injury carpal tunnel syndrome median nerve posterior dislocation hip sciatic nerve anterior dislocation hip femoral nerve head of fibula common peroneal nerve yes treatment of choices fracture clavicle conservative proximal humerus you assess which nearest type type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 4 conservative type 2 k wire fixation type 3 fillos plating type 4 shoulder arthroplasty anterior shoulder dislocation coccus method shaft of humerus fracture open reduction internal fixation with plate osteosynthesis supracondylar fracture again depends upon gartland's classification type 1 type 2 type 3 type 1 conservative okay uh, above elbow long arm long arm cast above elbow cast in 110 degree flexion enough type 2 gartland fracture is complete partially displaced you reduce it fix it with k wire type 3 complete fracture totally displaced open reduction internal fixation with k wire i repeat once again supracondylar alone very very important gartland type 1 conservative type 2 closed reduction percutaneous spinning type 3 open reduction internal fixation with cross k wires Montagia's fracture, it depends upon the age. In a child, conservative. In an adult, open reduction internal fixation with Asian DCP plate. Open reduction internal fixation with plate osteosynthesis. Galliacy fracture, whether child or adult, no problem. 100% it needs surgery. So, it's called uh, fracture of necessity. So, Galliacy fracture, open reduction internal fixation with long plate and screw. The word long is very important because Galliacy fracture is fracture lower third radius with the distal radial nerve joint subluxation. Only when you put a long plate that will stabilize the distal radial nerve joint subluxation. So, the word long plate is very important. Holy's fracture, conservative. Barton's fracture, surgery. Okay, open reduction internal fixation with T plate, T buttress plate. Bennett fracture, it is fracture of the base of the oblique fracture of the intraarticular fracture of the base of the first metacarpal thumb so it is close reduction k wire fixation because the one fragment is pulled by abductor policies longest tendon so it needs k wire fixation conservative management will fail mostly rolando is community fracture at the base of the first metacarpal so open reduction internal fixation with mini screw uh, neck of femur fracture again it depends upon the age and the garden's type there is no time to uh, discuss all those things by three ways you can manage if, the, if it is totally, it is incomplete fracture, fix it with three point screw fixation or dynamic hip screw. If it is complete, mostly it will go for uh, uh, avascular necrosis. So, do a hemiarthroplasty or total hip replacement depending upon the age. Intratrochanteric fracture can be managed. It should be stable or unstable. When lesser trochanter is intact, it's called stable. Lesser trochanter is not intact, it's called unstable. Stable intratrochanteric fracture, dynamic hip screw is the treatment of choice. Unstable intratrochanteric fracture, proximal femoral nail is the treatment of choice. Post dislocation, hip, the method is classical Watson Jones technique. Then Bigelow's method. Two methods you should know because 50 percentage of the books are voting for classical Watson Jones, 50 percentage are voting for Bigelow's. This is going to be a controversial question. Have both in your mind and we should pray to God both should not appear in the choices. Shaft of femur fracture, intramedullary interlocking nail. Shaft of tibia, intramedullary interlocking nail. Acute osteomyelitis, medical. Chronic osteomyelitis, surgical. That is called, what is that? Sequistectomy and saucerization. Myositis ossificans. Drug of choice if they ask for myositis ossificans. Drug of choice if they ask, drug of choice is indomethacin. Okay, treatment of choice, surgical excision. Be very careful, I repeat once again, dear friends. Treatment of choice of myositis is medical treatment if they ask, drug of choice if they ask, indomethacin. 
should give rest for six weeks. After six weeks, definitive treatment or treatment of choice is surgical excision of the myositis mass. Exostosis, excision with wall cauterization. Osteogenic sarcoma, surgery. Surgery. But the new Apple is telling, first you should give a pre-op radiotherapy, then sur surgery, post-op chemotherapy. So this is called a combined approach, other is called a sandwich therapy. Ewing sarcoma, the point why I added here Ewing sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma is only bone tumor that will melt with radiotherapy. With radiation that will melt, like a candle it will melt. But again it will come up, so treatment of choice is surgery. They will tempt you dear friends because all of us we know Ewing sarcoma means it, it melts with radiation. The word, this word is strongly embedded in our hippocampus. So, our treatment of choice for Ewing sarcoma, choice here radiotherapy. You go and tempt to take radiotherapy. No, no, no. Treatment of choice is surgery. Okay. Radiation will bring down the size of the tumor. Okay. Yes. Then multiple myeloma, it is melphalan drug. Okay. It's called scum regime, steroid, urethane. Okay. Um, uh, so it's a steroid, cyclophosphamide, urethane, melphalan. It's called scum regime. So, melphalan, that's why the trade name of melphalan is called myeloron. That's a drug of choice. Okay. Yes. Then, 100th question, very important question. Sir, can I win? Okay. The straightforward answer 100% you can win and you will win. Okay. So, dear friends, we are done. Okay. We are done. Right. Guaranteed you are going to win. See, 100 online as we had seen. At least I think, wouldn't, wouldn't we have seen 200 MCQs, 220 MCQs? In that, they won't ask 5 or 6. Guaranteed. Okay, then the purpose is done. All the best, dear friends. Okay, all of us, we are going to win. Thank you so much.